when they were rebuilding the Kaaba, they would go outside of Mecca to carry rocks, to carry stones into Mecca. And it's the summer heat. And these rocks would be burning hot and they would put them on their back. So the Arabs of Jahiliyyah, just like in our times, um, society around us, did not view it to be immodest if men took off their clothes in front of men or if women took off their clothes in front of women. To this day, as you know, in the locker room, uh, in, in the culture we live in, they don't consider it to be something crude. It's something, it's okay for them. For our sharia, it's not. But for them, it's something permissible. It's not something immoral. So, the rest of the men had taken their clothes off because it's so hot and because they need a piece of cloth to protect them from the stone. So they would take their cloth and put it on their back and then take the rock and put that on the cloth. Our Prophet ﷺ was the only man who was still wearing his cloth. His own uncle Hamza said, Oh my nephew, isn't it too hot? Why don't you take your garment off and put it on your neck to protect you from this burning hot rock? And so the Prophet ﷺ, he tried to unclasp his izar, his lower garment, to put it on. But he fell unconscious right then and there. This hadith is in Bukhari. He fell unconscious right then and there. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal would not allow our Prophet ﷺ to do this. He would not allow this to occur. He fell unconscious. And when he came to, he said, give me my izar, give me my, my, my garment. And he wrapped himself up and he was never ever then, he never took that off again. So it, Allah Azza wa Jal protected him from even something that his own society did not view as immoral, but it goes against what we know to be the perfection of Sharia. Other miracles that he was given, dreams, dreams, even before he became a prophet, we're not yet getting to the prophethood. Dreams, the Prophet ﷺ would dream about what's happening the next day. He would, he would dream that tomorrow I'm going to meet so and so, I'm going to have a business transaction, I'm going to be doing tawaf, and the next day, exactly that would happen. And this was not a one-off occasion. Every single night, for at least six months, we know, maybe even longer than this, for at least six months, every single night, when he'd go to sleep, he'd dream of the future. Not just the distant future, tomorrow. And when he woke up, it would happen exactly as he dreamed. Why? Allah is preparing him. That I'm going to tell you something. I'm preparing you for what will lie ahead. Also, on his journey to Syria, we know that when he was walking, on his journey to Syria, the sun never touched him. The clouds just followed along with him. And even Khadija's own servant, Maysara, even Khadija's own servant, Maysara said, I couldn't believe wherever he went, the clouds followed him. Wherever he went, there was a cloud. So much so when he stopped, the cloud stopped. And when he stood up to go, the cloud continued on. These are miracles. He's, nobody's demanding, nobody's challenging, but they're happening. And the people around see this. The Stones in Mecca would say salam to him. The stones in Mecca. He said to Aisha once, that stone, I remember it in my days before Islam, it used to say salam to me every time I passed by it. And do you think he imagined this? Once he picked up the stones and the Sahaba around him, they heard the stone saying subhanallah, 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 because it was in his hand. They heard this, the whole, the whole Muslim community around him. They heard the stone speaking. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ Everything gives tasbih of Allah. But you just cannot hear it. You just cannot see it. So many other miracles. After his prophethood, after the prophecy began, so many miracles. Of them, Allah protected him from physical harm. Many times the Quraysh tried to physically harm him. And of the most public of these harmings was Abu Jahl. You all know Abu Jahl, the arch enemy of Islam. And one day some famous person converted, so Abu Jahl blew a fuse. And he went to the Quraysh and he said, where is this man? Where is Muhammad? They said he comes and he prays once in a while in front of the Kaaba. Abu Jahl says he dares to pray in public? He has the audacity to pray in public? They said yes. He said, and he lowers his face on the sand? They said yes, that's the way we pray. So he said, Wallahi, I will put, astaghfirullah, my foot on his head. Next time he does this, I'm going to put my foot on his head. You, and he's challenging, he's threatening. You see me. Lo and behold, he's sitting there 
the Prophet ﷺ comes and he starts praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he lowers his head. Abu Jahl stands up, rushes to try to put his foot on the head of the Prophet ﷺ and just as he gets close, all of a sudden he stops. And they see him pushing his hand back. They see nothing. But they see him pushing his hand back and he's putting his head far away. He said, get back, get back. And then he comes back frightened. They said, what happened? He said, between me and him, I saw a fire appear. I saw a fire appear. And I was just trying to push it away. And later on, the Prophet told Abu Bakr and others, if he had come one inch closer, one inch closer, the angels would have taken him and stripped, just shredded him up completely. Allah Azza wa Jal physically protected our Prophet so many times, up until the night of the Hijra itself, the famous incident, right? When the Quraysh finally lost all their senses completely. And they said, we will publicly assassinate him. Even if he's the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. We'll publicly assassinate him. And they sent 50 assassins, one from each of the tribes, to surround the entire house, monitoring and guarding it. Now let's see how he's going to escape. And you all know the story. That Jibreel told him, go out now and recite Surah Yasin. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ We blinded them, they couldn't see. And the Prophet ﷺ took some sand and he put it on each and every one of their heads. This is what happens when you try to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And he walked out right from their midst. This is miracles that they see it, that how could he possibly have escaped? And yet, they still do not see it from their hearts. They're blinded in the hearts. And Allah Azza wa made their eyesight blind as well. Miracles that occurred uh, in front of their eyes. The Prophet ﷺ, when he went on the journey of Isra and Mi'raj, which is another miracle, when he comes back, he tells them, I was in Jerusalem last night. I was in Jerusalem last night. Now the Quraysh cannot believe this. And they said, do you expect us to believe that you went to Jerusalem, which takes one month to go to, and you came back, which takes another month, and now you're here amongst us, you did this in one hour? Of course, in our time, subhanAllah, we don't even find this amazing because we can do this ourselves in one night. But for the Quraysh, can you imagine? It's like, wallah, if somebody would have said, I went to the moon and came back. You, you just can't do that at that time and place. And the Prophet ﷺ has never been to Jerusalem, except for that time. It's the only time he went to actual Jerusalem. So they're wondering what to do. How could you? He's dead serious. He says, yes, I did. Now, what are you going to say? They know he's al amin They know he's an honest man. How are you going to refute this? One man stood up, he says, I know. I've been to Jerusalem so many times. Let me quiz you and see if you know the streets, if you know the territory, if you know the holy temples, if you can describe it for me. And the Quraysh said, this is a good idea. Yes, if you've been, surely you can describe. Now, the Prophet went for an hour. It was at night, right? And so the Prophet said, I became terrified, he's narrating this in the first person, in a manner that I had never become terrified before. Because I didn't remember every detail. Now subhanAllah, if you've been to one place and came back, right? If I told you which shopping center you went to today, to describe me every department store, every aisle, every lane, to tell me what was in lane number five and what was in lane seven, you don't remember. It's not, you're not paying attention. And so the man began questioning. And the Prophet could not remember because it's too detailed. So he might have asked him, you know, where is the suq of, of the gold? You know, which street is this on? And where is this and where is that? And our Prophet ﷺ, he didn't remember to that level of detail. Perhaps he didn't even go to those places he's asking about. Because remember, he went on a miraculous animal. The animal parked in, literally in front of the holy temple. He prayed there and he went up. He didn't go to the suq. He didn't see the grand temples, the other temples there. So the man is quizzing him like a tourist would be quizzed. And he wasn't a tourist. And so he said, I became terrified, the likes of which I had never ever been before. And I didn't know what to do. And as I'm terrified there, I saw Jibreel in the distance. Pick up for me the city of Jerusalem. And bring it so that I could see. And any time he asked me a question, I just looked at the city. And I responded to each and every question. Until finally when the man had run out of all of his mind, he said, as for my questions, well, he has spoken the truth. 
I have nothing else to ask him. This is exactly how Jerusalem is. This is a miracle. This is a public inquisition about something the Prophet physically, according to them, has never seen. And yet, he manages to breeze through all of the questions. One of the main miracles that is narrated, and this type of miracle, we have over 50 reports, is numerous times, small quantities of food or water become numerous, become quanti quantified. And of course, this is a common miracle because food was scarce. Food was not uh, in a lot. And therefore, a lot of times, the Muslims didn't have enough food. What are they going to do? They need some food. This is not a miracle on demand. This is a miracle by necessity. What are you going to do? You need that food. And so we have over 50 reports, reported by hundreds of companions. They saw this with their eyes, that our Prophet Sallallahu made dua to Allah, and he made a small quantity of, of food suffice for a large quantity of people. And of them is the famous, some of them are actually funny because of the, the, the narrations, of them is the story of Anas ibn Malik. Anas ibn Malik is a little kid. He's probably six, seven years old. And his stepfather, Abu Talha, and Umm Sulaim is his mother. His stepfather and his, uh, and his mother, Umm Sulaim, they notice that the Prophet is extremely weak because he does